as you already said, welcome to my presentation about um, the security security of a security camera. Um, so about, about a year ago, actually during my undergrad, um, I had to do a project and I decided to analyze an IoT camera because I thought that's it's a very it's a it's a recent topic, it's an interesting topic. Um, and it's more, becoming more and more important. Um, and so I thought, okay, what could be interesting? So I chose a camera. Um, and I did actually find some very interesting stuff which I'm gonna share with you today. So first of all, a little bit about myself. Uh, as I already mentioned, my name is Clemens. Uh, I'm currently studying advanced security and digital forensics at Napier, uh, which is a master's course. I am a member of NUSEC, as you can see. And I am also on Twitter, if anyone wants to follow me. I'm not really very active, but yeah. Um, all right, so let's get to the interesting part, the actual camera. Um, now the camera that I used, that I chose, was uh, the D-Link DCS932L. Um, it's marketed or described by D-Link as the complete surveillance solution for your home or small office. So it's um, aimed at um, home use. Um, and what it is, is essentially it's a security camera. It's operated via a uh, web interface, which means it's connected to a network, which is great for us because we can actually see if we can do something with it. Um, it has some cool features like motion detection um, and email notifications, and especially those email notifications will become um, important later on. Um, so there are actually there are so many different camera models, especially just from just from uh, that manufacturer available. So basically, the actual decision for this was kind of for this uh, device was kind of random. I basically just chose the one that popped up on Amazon. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's basically the same thing with other devices. So let's have a look at the actual web interface of the camera. And you can already see the first problem. Um, it says the browser you're using may have difficulties. Please use Internet Explorer or Safari. Now, especially for me as, um, as a Linux user, that's not what I want to hear at all. <laughs> Um, but and interestingly enough, this actually just appeared with the uh, the most recent version. So with older version versions that that problem did not um, occur. So they actually changed it for the worse in the recent up <coughs> in the recent update. But oh well. Um, yeah. So this is the actual interface. As you can see, it's kind of looks kind of old, kind of static. Um, it's not very. It's not very impressive. As you can see, it's very straightforward. So there's the menu. Um, you can see the model of the camera. And also you can see basically the heart of the camera, the actual video stream here on the main page. Um, and then there's the other settings, everything, user management, and so on, on other pages. Um, so I had a deeper look into that interface and found some very interesting flaws, very strange things as well um, that I'm going to go through now. So basically, first of all, I'm, I'm now I'm just going to go through all those findings and then I'm going to basically um, present a, a possible process that uh, an attacker could use to, to use those flaws. So the first thing is um, encryption. Um, the first thing I noticed when I, when I logged into the camera is um, everything, all authentication on the camera is on the web interface is done via basic authentication. So you get that little pop-up and you have to enter your credentials. Now basic authentication on its own doesn't provide any any hashing or encryption or whatever of um, credentials. So it's, it can be potentially vulnerable. Usually it should be used at least with um, HTTPS to at least make the transit um, secure. Uh, the camera actually does support HTTPS, but it's not enforced. So if you just type in the IP address of the camera, it doesn't redirect you to the HTTPS uh, side. Um, so you have to manually type in HTTPS to, um, colon dash dash, which obviously a lot of people aren't going to do because they don't even know about it. So most of the time, the credentials are sent in plain text, which obviously is a bad thing. Um, also, another bad side effect of that that I realized was logging out of that camera is basically impossible, honestly. Um, there's a lockout, if you look at that, there's a lockout button here. It just doesn't do anything at all. It just shows you something, it shows you like 
<laughs> yeah, you are being locked out now, but it doesn't lock you out, doesn't do anything. Um, also, closing the window didn't help. Closing the browser didn't help. Clearing cookies didn't help. What did it in the end was clearing active sessions um, from the history of the browser, which is a setting that I didn't really didn't really know about. I had to actually look it up where it is exactly. That's the only way I could actually log out of that camera, which is very strange to say the least. Uh, now on to user accounts and password guidelines. So um, there are some very bad design choices there. So first of all, there are two two different types of accounts. Um, there's the admin account that's always there. It's always exactly one admin account. It has full access to everything on the interface, which is basically the video stream and all the settings. And the username can't be changed. It's always admin. Um, and it, it's actually within the camera. You'll see that later. It's actually handled differently than the other accounts. Um, for that account, the password can be anything between 0 and 32 characters. So you can actually have an empty password if you want to. And you're limited to ASCII characters. So that kind of limits the key space as well. And then there is a second type, which is just a normal user account. Now you can have an arbitrary number of those accounts. It can be anything between 0 and... I didn't check how many you can put in, but yeah, any amount. Um, for these types of accounts, the password is actually limited to 8 characters. Just basically nothing. The minimum should be eight, maybe, but not the maximum. Um, so all that means that it's possible, the camera makes it possible for users to have very weak security because it doesn't enforce any, any baselines. Um, and the thing is, people are going to use, uh, weak passwords because it's a convenient thing. They chose, they choose passwords that are easy to remember, easy to type in. Um, so if the device doesn't force people to use at least some security standard, people aren't going to do that um, because they don't really have, or a lot of people um, that don't really have a strong sense of security, so they can't, they can't judge that. Another very strange thing regarding uh, passwords and user accounts is when you look at the the HTML code of the user management page on the on the interface, um, you can see that the actual the admin password is immediately included in that page um, as a hash. It's just always there. <laughs> even if it's not even specifically the change password or anything page, it's just always in the user management page. It's hashed, so it's not plain text, but the hash is MD5 without any salt or anything. So um, yeah. <laughs> Um, and then it gets better because if you change the admin password, the client actually, so in the, the password, the new password that you put in and the password that's in here is, um, compared on the client side in JavaScript. And if they match, then the new password is submitted to the server and updated. So there is no control over what's happening there because obviously if it's JavaScript, the client can change whatever he wants and do whatever you want, basically. Um, so obviously, passwords, even if it's just a hash, shouldn't just be included in, in an HTML code. And logic like that, any logic in general, but logic like that especially should not be on the client side. It should all be on the server. Now, another thing that's just a bad design choice for me is... Um, there is this option in the menu where you can disable authentication for a specific subpage. Um, and that page, so that page is slash image slash jpeg.cgi. And if you access that, it gives you uh, like a snapshot as an image um, of the video stream. So you can actually disable authentication for that. Which um, I don't really see the use case for that because as I said, this camera is, is meant for home use and maybe small offices. So, so there's no really a use case for having a, uh, for having a public, um, public image or like public video stream. And the thing is, you could say, yeah, so just don't enable it. But again, if there's the option to have a more, if there's an option that's more convenient, a lot of people are going to use that without thinking about that they might actually give random people on the internet, um, access to their camera feed. 
because it again, yeah, it encourages users to to reduce their own security level. Now let's look at something that's an actual bug and not just a bad design choice. Um, I realized that while I was playing around with the, with the with the different pages, that some of the pages on the web server didn't ask for any authentication. They just immediately gave me requests forbidden. Um, when I tried to access them, I just couldn't even put in any credentials. And that seemed strange to me because I expected to get at least the usual basic authentication pop-up asking for credentials, but I didn't. I just got nothing. Um, and especially one of those files, this one here, slash cgi slash common dot cgi, kind of looked interesting to me. Um, and so I kind of wanted to see what's in there. And after trying a few things, basically, actually, just by chance, I found out that um, when I intercepted the request and added a referrer to the HTTP request, it suddenly worked. I could access the page. And that referrer is completely arbitrary. It can be any string. The only thing that matters is that it says referrer, that the field is in the header. You can even leave it empty if you want to. It just has to be there. And then it suddenly worked. And I could get uh, this file here. And then I saw, actually, yeah, that file is actually, in, uh, in fact, very interesting because um, there's some cool information about the camera that you normally wouldn't have or shouldn't have, definitely shouldn't have. Um, so this can be an excellent source for a recon as well. So what you have is you have the model and firmware and um, firmware version, build, ver uh, build number, hardware version as well. Um, there's a field called location that the user can set uh, if uh, if they want, uh, so it's not always going to be set. Like in my case, I mean, this is for my camera. I didn't set it, um, but if it's if there's something in there, it might give you a clue as to what where the camera is, maybe which room it is, or something like that. If it's in someone's house, um, and last but not least, there's some network information as well. So you have the IP address of the camera, you have the net mask, and you have the IP address of the router. So you get a basic idea of the of the topology of the network um, that the camera is in, which is also very interesting and something you shouldn't necessarily um, have. So <coughs> after looking, ar looking around for a while, actually I'll go back for a second. Um, so after looking around in that CGI folder uh, for a while that I mentioned where that com.cgi file was in, I noticed there are some other interesting looking files in there as well. Files that were called something like system.cgi or userlist.cgi. Um, but unfortunately, I couldn't, I couldn't use the same trick I had used before with the referrer. It didn't work. But I figured out that um, <coughs> if you actually log into the camera and then use the referrer as well, so you need those two things, then you can access them. Um, and now let's have a look at those files. So you can already see the big, big problem here. Password, password, password. All in clear text, nothing hashed. All in, clear in plain text in the camera. Um, so as you can see, yeah, you have the admin password in here. Um, and that's why I meant when I said that those two accounts are, the, those two types of accounts are handled differently. So you have the admin that's managed in here in system.cgi and you have all the other normal users with their passwords, um, also in plain text. And then there's this thing here, emails. So I mentioned earlier you have email notifications. You can enable email notifications um, if, if the motion detector um, detects motion. Um, then you can have the camera <laughs> send you an email with a, a, sh a short bit of video to, um, to alert you. So to do that, to be able to do that, the camera needs uh, an existing email account to send those emails from. And you have to put credentials in for that. So what you can see here is exactly that. So you have the email account, you have the username, which is usually the email account, um, account as well, and you have the password for that email account, um, which is visible, which you also shouldn't really get that easily. Um, now, quick reminder, it's not actually that bad because, as I said, you have to be logged in as the admin user, so you, not anyone can just see that. But still, just the fact that all those passwords and everything are stored in plain text there just shows that the developers, they just didn't have any um, awareness for security whatsoever. So the whole back end is, is flawed in that sense. And we can use that. So basically, 
let's go through a, a possible way to, to exploit uh, the stuff that I showed before. So obviously it starts with getting the IP address, the, uh, the address of the actual camera um, that you want to um, attack or just look at. <laughs> so either you have a specific camera that you already know um, the, IT, uh, the IP address of because you know exactly what it is or because you found it during recon or something, or you could just, uh, or an attacker could just um, randomly choose a camera that uh, you can find them e very easily on Showdown, for, exa for example, you can find thousands of cameras. Um, I'll get to that later in, um, as well. Um, now, now that you have the IP address, what you can do is you can brute force the password. We know that the admin account always has the same username, so we don't have to guess anything with that. And we know that the password is potentially quite weak, um, so we can try brute force. And I wrote, I wrote a little, very little um, pr proof of concept script that basically just goes through the list of um, the hundred most common passwords until and tries to log in with those until it gets uh, status two hundred, so a successful login, um, and then just prints the password. Obviously, this can be made a lot more sophisticated. This is just to show to, to show my point. I could paralyze it uh, and so on. Uh, now, after getting that password, which obviously, depending on the password, uh, depending on the password, might not be that easy, but it will be in a lot of case in a lot of the cases. Um, with that password, you can now log in, and basically, you're, you're already lost. Um, so, what you can do is you can get the video stream, for example. So, my script just takes that snapshot um, slash image, uh, the one I showed before, uh, slash, slash image dot slash, no, slash image slash jpeg dot cgi, um, just downloads that file as a snapshot, as, G as a jpeg. Um, you could also just get a whole stream if you wanted to, if you just add those pictures together, because you can just reload if you want to. Um, and then the last thing, or the second to last thing you do is use that trick with, once you're logged in, you can add a referrer to your request and you can get the email credentials from the email.cgi file. Um, now, once you have those credentials, you can log into that person's email account. So you have something like that. Now, this is basically to do that, to try it out if, if, or if it's all working, I just set up, set up a demo account on a demo email account set up on the camera just to go through the whole thing. So that's basically like you have super secret messages, private messages, whatsoever, whatever. That you can access. So now, what you have is, what you have is, um, we went from just knowing the IP address or just knowing that the camera is there. We went to <coughs> having a view into someone's home in the video feed and someone's email account within a very short amount of time. And that's even more concerning. Um, what's even more concerning is that the script I use is less than thirty lines long. It's not very complicated. It's quite a simple script, um, and it really doesn't take long either to to, to do it. Um, so that's you can see how 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 that's very bad design there on the camera. Uh, now let's talk about um, firmware versions for a minute. So, as I mentioned, the original research I did was a while ago, a year ago, in January two thousand eighteen, actually. Um, so the version I used back then, the version I based this whole talk on was 2.14. Um, since then, there were two updates, 2.16 and 1.7, that fixed most of the problems that I mentioned, basically all of them, um, and therefore made, basically made the attack impossible, so you can't get any passwords anymore, at least with the, at least with that method. Um, so that's good news generally. Um, however, as far as I could tell, I briefly looked at, at the new version and um, I think the, uh, the backend hasn't changed at all, so the passwords are still um, stored in plain text. You just can't access them that easy anymore, but I'm sure there's still going to be a way to do that if you look hard enough. Um, so it's just, I mean, they did at least address the problem and generally made the software better. Uh, even if the general core is still flawed, but you know, you take what you get. Um, now you could think, okay, everything's fine, the issues are fixed, mostly um, the device is kind of secure. However, if you look at that, I just made a little graph of um, different firmware, firmware versions that I could find in the wild, actually, basically today, 
Um, so these are the versions. So as you can see, these are very old versions in some cases, very, very old. And as you can see, there are a lot of hundreds of devices there with very old versions. With some of those versions actually still have um, a lot more vulnerabilities like command injections and stuff like that that you can use to do even more. Um, and I, so I got that graph by just searching for the for that specific device model on Shodan, and then I got a list of all the IP addresses, and then I got the versions from that to 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 assess that. Um, so these are only devices that are available on the internet, accessible on the internet, um, because obviously I can't get any info on, on devices that are in local uh, in local networks without committing a crime. Um, but I'm guessing it's going to be the same with uh, these cameras as well. I don't think there are going to be more um, more recent versions. Um, and there's a reason why there are so many very old versions still around for that, and I'm going to come to that in a minute. Because um, another thing you have to take into account, which makes this far worse, is there are a lot of different models for that camera. So these are just 14 different ones where, where I know for sure that they use the same firmware. Um, I just found those by looking through the specs uh, on the Link support uh, website. Um, actually, there's a much larger, uh, larger attack surface. There are, um, just in that DCS model um, series, there are about 120 different models, um, a lot of which are going to use that firmware with slight variations depending on their features. Um, but there are definitely a lot, a lot more devices than what I showed in that graph um, in the wild on the internet accessible and um, vulnerable. Right. Um, so basically this camera is just another example that shows how far away from being secure a lot of um, IoT, kind of IoT smart home devices are nowadays because you read about it all the time, you hear in other talks and stuff like that where people just find horrible vulnerabilities in, in devices like that. And it's especially bad for this kind of device because they potentially give an attacker such um, insight into a, per a person's personal life, um, much more than other devices, which is very concerning. And, and now for me, there are kind of three big lessons that come from lessons or mitigation strategies um, that a user can employ to kind of try and make these, at least try and make the devices a lot, uh, a lot more secure, even though the device as such might not be as secure. Um, and no, this is kind of, I mean, most of that is known. I just wanted to get it out as, um, again. So the first is obviously strong passwords, long passwords, um, especially in this case for the admin user because the name can't be changed. So it's only the password that has to be guessed. Um, that's the thing about the camera, about this camera. It allows bad passwords. And as I said, that's it's convenient, so people are going to do that. Um, so there needs to be a lot more awareness on password security on both the developer side and the user side. And the second thing is regular updates. And I mentioned there's a reason for uh, why there are so many old versions. It's because the the, cam the camera or dealing couldn't possibly have made it um, harder to update the firmware. So first of all. There are no notifications if the new version is out whatsoever. So you have to check the support website regularly. And what you have to do is you have to go to the support website, choose your model of your camera, choose your hardware version, which is somewhere on this code here on the back. So you have to find out, find that out. Um, then you have to download the, uh, the firmware binary. You have to upload it on the interface of the camera and then you can install it. So it's such a long process that uh, a user that's not that doesn't really know about tech um, is definitely not going to do, at least not regularly, um, which explains why there are so many very, very old versions around because in some, pe uh, some cases people might not even know that there are updates at all. Um, and so again, there needs to be this, this process should be a lot easier. Um, it should be straightforward, there should be notifications. It should basically just pop up and say, there's a new update, install, please. <laughs> um, and number three, probably the biggest one, do not make your devices available on the internet. I, I saw the, the basic, um, the first search on Shodan I did for that specific model showed me about more than 6,000 devices. 
and that's just one model out of 120, and that's just one series of models. Um, so a lot of devices that are just available on the internet, and a lot of them are vulnerable to um, some variations of um, different flaws. Um, so don't there's there's two sides to that um, because on the one hand, it obviously if the camera is shit, if the camera is bad, then it might be hacked, and you have especially like personal info that's leaked or um, email accounts or video streams or stuff like that. But also it can be kind of a way in for a hacker into your network in some cases, depending on the vulnerabilities. Um, so you can compromise your whole network. And with people having more and more different devices, that attack service just, just gets a lot bigger if you have those available, accessible on the internet. So if you actually need to, for some reason, uh, access that outside of your uh, local network, just use a VPN, which again, obviously, I get is, is a problem for normal users, like non-tech users, because again, it's not that easy to just set that up. It is getting easier nowadays, but that it's it's an ongoing thing to make that easier for 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 everyone. And that's all for me. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for listening, and thank you to NUSEC for giving me the opportunity to do this, uh, my first ever conference talk here. <laughs>